Honorable Minister of Local Government, Dr. Suraj Rambachan, uh, of course with us also Mayor of San Fernando and the Alderman and Councillors of the City of San Fernando, uh, MP for San Fernando West, the Minister of Public Administration, Ms. Karen Sibasad Becha, MP for Mayaro, the Honorable Winston Gypsy Peters, uh, Minister of Community Development, and I think also with us, Honorable Minister of uh, our new Ministry of Diversity and Social Integration, Honorable uh, Mr. Clifton Dikoto, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Local Government, Mr. Ali, Distinguished Mayors, Chairmen, uh, all local government practitioners, and all of you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I say good evening to you. As we say, this is a very special time, in my respectful view, in our governance agenda for the government and people of Trinidad and Tobago. You may recall that it was only last Saturday we successfully launched the public consultations on the reform of our constitution. Tonight, we begin the very important consultations on the transformation and modernization of local government. You may also recall that in our election manifesto of 2010, and in our conversations in the run-up to that election in 2010 with you, with our population, with the electorate, we raised several issues and we made several pledges to you. That manifesto of 2010 is now government's official policy document. And we promised then to engage in discussions towards constitutional reform, as well as with respect to modernizing and transforming local government. I do believe that we are perhaps the very first government which has had the courage to place in the parliament our manifesto so that our performance may be evaluated by the people of Trinidad and Tobago. True to our word, that process of consultation has begun. Indeed, if you were to revisit the manifesto of the People's Partnership, you will see that government has been delivering in line with the provinces outlined in the manifesto. We also indicated that we would publish a document, a local government policy document, which will form the basis for local government reform. And I'm sure some of you may have copies of these, they are online, and uh, you can access them through the Ministry of Local Government and all the regional corporations uh, and cities available. Not online yet? The corruption? Is it online? It's available on the site of the Minister of Local Government. And of course, the hard copies have been advised can be obtained right here in the city of San Fernando and all of the 14 uh, corporations, yes? So please make sure and get a copy of it so that you can better uh, contribute to discussions and the consultations on local government reform. And so, this document, as I say, was published in keeping with our promise and we are here this evening to inaugurate the public discussions. I make these observations if only to emphasize that my government understands the contact and the contract it has with the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And that we are intent on fulfilling the promises that we have made. Of course, there will be short-term and long-term goals. And so today I want to place on record our thanks to the former Minister of Local Government, Mr. Chandra Sharma, as well as Mr. Rujanath Indar Singh, who was in the Ministry of Local Government, and also MP, who is now Deputy Speaker of the House, Ms. Nila Khan, who was also then in the Ministry of Local Government. We want to thank them for their inputs into this document while they serve in the Ministry of Local Government. Please give them a round of applause. I also want to acknowledge the work and contribution of the many dedicated public servants who were involved in the creation of the policy document. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, as many of you know, for myself, I started my career in governance and government and politics in 1987, as Carol has mentioned, in the local government system. I began as an alderman at the then St. Patrick County Council, now partly the Sabara Regional Corporation. 23 years after I began working in local government, I was elected as Prime Minister of our country. I want to make it very clear that my stint in local government allowed me to have a deeper understanding of the problems faced 
by local government practitioners and the staff of the corporations in getting resources, in meeting the needs of constituents and local government being the point of first call for the problems that constituents experience and face. Two years ago, in my capacity as patron of the Commonwealth Local Government Forum, an association of local government authorities out of the 54 member states of the Commonwealth, I made the following observation, and I wish to quote it for you this evening. On that occasion in Cardiff, in Wales, I said, and I quote, when we speak of local government, inevitably we speak of local democracy, of participation in local governance, of self-determination in the developmental affairs of a particular region, end of quote. In that particular local government conference, which was being held at a time when the world looked on with great interest and anticipation at the evolving situation in the Middle East countries and in North Africa, where the demand for democratic practices and freedom to participate in the modes of governance were being demanded, and where people were prepared to die to achieve this. That was the context in which the statement was made. The reality is that <clears throat> wherever people are alienated from the process and structures which determine their governance, there is likely to be a loss of community energy and indeed is likely to be frustration often leading to conflict. The flight fight syndrome becomes a real possibility. And so when people are allowed to create a shared destiny, they work harder to achieve it and also to protect and sustain it. A truer sense of ownership is developed in individuals who are part of such a process. It is then that prosperity becomes a very real possibility for all. It is with this particular goal in mind where citizens all walk, of all walks of life should have a say in how governance of the communities are organized, that we are proceeding with consultations on both the constitution and, as well, local government modernization and transformation. My government is very aware of society's new definition of governance. However, the evidence of our approach to managing the affairs of the nation has demonstrated that consensus building has been at the heart of our governance model. The level of public discourse on matters of public concern has never been as extensive and as widespread as it is and has been under my administration. I have no quarrels with that. I have no compunction with that. I have no difficulty with that. People demand more and they deserve more. And so I believe that we have succeeded as a government in bringing more people into the process of governance than any other government in the past. I truly believe this. And now we come to local government. Local government gives us the unique opportunity to involve people in decision making. Quite often, these decisions do not remain at local level. They reach the cabinet table and they reach the parliament table. And so, that gives a national face to the functioning of local government. It is one of my personal desires that this process of involvement and influence by local communities, working through your corporations, will be deepened in the modernization which is intended. As a result, the structures to encourage this deeper involvement must form part of the reform agenda. The heart of the success of a nation will always in my respectful view, be measured by the satisfaction people derive from contributing to the development of their communities and of course to their village, their city, their town, and indeed to the entire nation. And that is what real empowerment is about. What I have found missing at times in our country is the commitment to nation building. Too many of us sit and are observers of, at what is happening. We have become commentators. There's absolutely nothing wrong in being a critic. <coughs> However, if we are to succeed as a people, as a nation, if we are to build a quality nation, one that is globally competitive, we must move beyond being mere critics and join the movement for a better Trinidad and Tobago. This country, 
this country belongs to all of us. We must collectively work to make it a better place. We must become responsive to Trinidad and Tobago. A great place to start is at the local level. And before I move on, please remember that world studies have found that Trinidad and Tobago is fifth in the world with the most happiest people in the world, number five. And so we come to the local level, the level of the communities. A nation is really an amalgam of communities. That is coming together of the communities, coming together of their values, their traditions, their culture, their social and economic experience. That's what a nation, a nation is about. There is not the whole. The whole is made up of the parts, the various parts. And so we start down at the village level, the community level, the town, the city, and we reach into what we call our nation. It is my considered view that local government is not only one of the best examples of democracy in action, but it also has the potential to unite communities around a shared vision and around a shared mission. In this way, and through the opportunity it provides for consensus building, elevated to a national level, it serves as a model for peace amongst people. It's for this reason <clears throat> that local authorities must be given the material and human resources to effect community agreed programs of work. The demise of local government in all parts of the world has had to do not so much with the ability to do as it has had to do with the lack of resources given to local government bodies. Side by side with this is the indifference of central governments to delegate real authority to local government bodies. And many local government practitioners are here, and I know you'll agree with me. The channeling of the resources and delegating authority on the local level, there's always been a reluctance to do that as governments tend to want to remain centralized. So across the road, there's a crying need to move from the rhetoric of empowerment to the active strategies to effect empowered authorities in the local sphere. I'm certain in your consultation that this matter will once again engage your attention at the various consultations throughout the country. It will not happen, however, unless we become committed to a philosophy of shared governance. Let us understand it is about shared governance. The alternative to shared governance and empowered communities will be internal conflicts and de-energized communities. I have said before and I say again, the belief that people have the right to be masters of their own destinies and to organize the affairs of their communities so as to experience the best quality of life is at the heart of our philosophy for local government. We believe that what people create, they appreciate, they protect, and they grow. We believe that one of the best ways to energize the creativity and commitment of a community is by inviting their participation in the way they are governed. These consultations will help to chart the way forward for a more responsive and effective local government system. And so, issues must be discussed. Recommendations must be made to effect the changes. In this regard, I want to share with you some of the issues I believe which may be useful in your consultations and to which you may want to address your minds to. We look forward to your recommendations and suggestions with respect to the following giving constitutional protection to local government. I do recall that for many years, because there was no constitutional protection to local government, that local government, government elections were postponed time and time and time again, with absolutely no respect for the democratic system of a one man, one vote, as we cherish under the rule of law, and in a democracy such as ours. And so we give local government uh, constitutional protection in the same way that general elections have constitutional protection, then no government, no government will be able to tinker with local governance in Trinidad and Tobago. So 
we look forward to hearing your thoughts on that. Secondly, your views, your recommendations, your suggestions on the issue of increasing the financial and human resources available to local government practitioners and authorities, and particularly in the case of the latter, determine what formula might be used to determine allocations. At the moment, how are these done? There is no formula, there's no established formula. It is just done uh, ad hoc, as it were. And so that is something you may want to consider. Very similar to what happened with the THA, for example, we passed the THA Act many months ago, a formula to work out what financial resources be allocated to local government bodies. Thirdly, you may want to consider, as Minister Ramachan just mentioned, whether we would want to empower corporations to borrow for self-sustaining projects. Again, we look forward to your suggestions and recommendations on that issue. Fourthly, we look forward to suggestions, recommendations, discussions on enhancing the capability of the state financed offices for local government representatives so as to impact upon more effective representation. Practitioners who are here, you understand what I'm saying? You may have an office that is, uh, in, indeed, it was my government that first gave to local government representatives <laughs> some resources to have an office and to function out of that office in the local communities. Again, we want to look at that again to enhance your capability um, through the state for your offices to be better functioning, to improve their functioning, and in that way to make you more effective in representing your constituents in the electoral district. Fifth, <clears throat> we look forward again to your suggestions uh, and consideration in examining functions which are now managed by central government and to see to what extent we delegate these to local government given the affinity of the function of local communities. So we want to see and look at the, 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 the functions carried out by the central government and which, if any of these, should be delegated down into the local government areas. So again, you will play a very important role in these consultations in helping us to arrive at some kinds of decisions as to functions that should become those of local government rather than remain under the central government system. Five, we look to discussions and consultations, which will examine functions. As I say, um, these are the functions from local to, from central to local. Six, creation of full-time local government representatives. That's a very interesting point. Because whilst you are uh, expected to function 24-7, as indeed as our MPs expected to function 24-7, there is a, an old school, old school view that to be a local government councillor, even to be an MP, that that is a part-time job. Now, anyone who has served at the local government level or as an MP gypsy, we know that you work 24-7. 24-7. <laughs> and some say 25, but that is humanly impossible. So 24-7. 24-7, and you go from 24-7 to 24-7, 12, yeah? 365 days per year, every day. And indeed, when it's a holiday, I think some of the days we work the most is on holidays. Because that's when sometimes things happen, they just happen. And then a constituent has nowhere to turn to. Because all offices are closed, so they look for the local government representative and or for their member of parliament. So, should we consider making these uh, posts, local government representative, we'll be looking at your reform as a full-time uh, position. Now that has several uh, consequences. What is a consequential amendments? Because when you make it full-time, then you're looking at uh, the remuneration packages that should go with a full-time job as well as with a part-time and so on. So that is another area, I think, that could be opened up for very fruitful discussions. So. Further, we consider, I know we, my government is seriously working on this, the construction of town halls in every district and using them for regular town meetings. This will bring you closer together with the constituents and of course help you to better represent your constituents. Further, increasing involvement of NGOs in the work of the local authorities 
especially social service delivery. So, yes, you are the local representative, but indeed we know as MPs, we also know that you work with NGOs. You can better assess the needs, whilst at the same time you can better deliver. They create an entire network through which you can go on a non-partisan basis, because once you're elected, you're no longer partisan. Once you're elected, you represent all the constituents in your electoral district that you can better then represent them with the help of non-governmental organizations. Another area you may want to look at. Training of local representatives in management and leadership skills, as well as skills related to the organization of people and communities. Training, so vital in every regard. And if I may make a confession, um, not too long ago, uh, I did a, a master's in business administration, and I had to do a thesis, and my thesis was in fact, on training of local government representatives. So perhaps, Minister, you may get a copy of my thesis from <laughs> UWI, UWI School of Business and share it. Um, I set up various models. I think you, you, you served as a resource person when I was doing my interviews to be able to uh, do that thesis. And if I may be immodest, I did very well when I did that course. <laughs> so training. Further, Reconsider the formulation of the national budget with greater inputs from local communities and so create a needs-driven and a needs-fulfillment model of governance. So, budgets are done. Yes, we do it on a party level. We'll come and say we're consulting our party with our local representatives for inputs to go into the budget. But we need to uh, maybe institutionalize that. So again, it is an area you may want to give thoughts to and to make suggestions for. Develop mechanisms for ensuring the local government fulfills a primary mandate, which is people-centered development. You will know from our manifesto, from my government, that one of the pillars of, of that manifesto, now official government policy, is that of people-centered development. And so we must ensure the local level as well that we keep to that mandate. Arriving at a common set of values, to guide the functioning of regional corporations in their relationship with the public. Now, I remember years ago, I will not name the councillor, but there was a councillor, when his constituents came to see him, he would stay upstairs of his house, and I think some of you will know who I'm speaking of, and he would have a basket on a rope, and he would let the basket down, and tell him, put a note in the basket. You see, the secretary is laughing, because the is laughing. Yeah. Some people are not speaking of. But there are others like that. So the relations, the human interaction and human relations. And you may tell me the local area, you have to do it, yes. And they'll say, you know, the MPs need some of that training too, and I will agree with you as well. So thank you very much. But how do we interact, you know, with, our, with, with the public? How do we interact with, the, uh, with our constituents? And so we need to arrive as I said, at a common set of values to guide the functioning of regional corporations in their relationship with the public. Consider the election or appointment of special representatives in each local authority. Male, female, youth representatives, representatives for women and children. Now at the moment, I believe at the, um, at the corporation level, all the men are to be selected for, uh, community, for out of the community for community uh, work, if I'm not mistaken, in the law, belonging to community groups and so on. So a suggestion may be that we look at whether we want to appoint others with special responsibility for youth. The famous song, Children Are Our Future, the young people, they are our future. And you may want to consider whether in this reform process we should consider having one representative in each local authority <clears throat> with responsibility and therefore as a representative of a young male youth, young female youth, and one representative for women and children. Consider also, as Mr. Ramchand has already pointed out, the best structure for regional cooperation. We have a structure now. Is it the best? Do we need to improve on it? Do we need to change it? How do we change it? What should be the framework? What should be the architecture for a regional cooperation? which will allow us, therefore, to better represent as well as to better deliver. Further, and I'm not going to be much longer because I know you want to talk and share your views with us, consider whether all heads of local government corporation should be called mayors, rather than you have some being called chairman and some being called mayors. Why? Is there a reason why? Does anyone know why? 
just history. Out of the history, perhaps. Yeah, that or colonial you say history. You're in a city, then you're a mayor. Yeah. But if you're in a regional corporation, you are the front chairman. chairman. But what are your functions? Are they the same or are they different? That is something you may want to consider. Whether you want to keep the same nomenclature when you have to perform the very same functions. And perhaps it is a way of old that country bookie must remain country bookie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it with no disrespect to anyone from the city of San Fernando or elsewhere. But if we are performing the same functions and we need to look at whether we reconsider that nomenclature to bring all into line as equity and equality because you perform the same function. So let's look at that as well. And as we're looking at naming, let's look at the functions of the cities, the boroughs, and the uh, corporations. What are the differences? And what, if these differences are they, are they necessary, are they relevant in today's world? Or should we also look into that to bring all into line? Equitably, equality, equity, let's look at that as well. If they need to remain different, then we must be very clear why they must remain different. But I remember, and I do not wish to be very political, but I do remember some who felt you could never get a prime minister from a guild come from Sparrow. And there is a view, I've not been politically, I've been very serious, there is a view that if you are from different areas in Trinidad or in Tobago, then you must be treated differently. My government has taken the position whether from the north, east, west, south, or across the water in Tobago, there must be equity, there must be equality, and there must be a distribution, equitable distribution of the resources of the land and the So let's look at it. You look at it. See what your functions are. Look at the existing law. Does that make sense? Does it need to be changed? Or should we keep it the same? Consultations on that. And finally, consider the role of the municipal police and whether they should be placed under the commissioner of police whilst they execute their function still at the local government level. So do we need a separate municipal police force? Or is it that we need the functions that they carry out and therefore they can be kept within the ambit of the commissioner of police, accountable to the commissioner of police? And when I say the commissioner of police, I mean the whole institution that is the TT police force. Or do we need separate entities as municipal police? I have no set view on that. I'm asking you in the consultations to uh, to consider it and come up with suggestions. These are some areas, I'm sure there will be many others. Uh, these are governance issues, framework issues, architectural issues in local governance. But there will be others that, are, you know, as constituents, you may have views as to how better your local government uh, corporation can serve your needs and suit your needs and deliver to you. Let me once again thank the Honourable Minister, Dr. Ramachan, for his very hard work in the Ministry of uh, Local Government. And may I also say, Dr. Ramachan is about to roll out how many projects with the minister? 800, 800 local roads to be paved in the very near future. 90 bridges will government bridges. 35 land slips in the local area and the pavilions. At the moment, there are seven, those are to roll out. At present, I'm advised there are 769 local government projects right in process and progress right now. So, Minister, thank you for your very, very hard work. Thank you for having these consultations and indeed your contribution to making this uh, document, the policy document, will get into fruition. Whilst we thank the former ministers and Mr. Local Government, Dr. Ramachand, for the icing on cake. So, please give him a round of applause. So good luck in your deliberations. Today begins day one of the consultations. I advise there are 13 more to come. A total of 14 uh, of these consultations throughout the length and breadth of our nation. So good luck tonight, good deliberations, and success. We look forward to the report coming out of this. May God continue to bless each and every one of you. May God continue to bless your families. And may God continue to bless our very great nation, Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Honorable Prime Minister, for having set the tone for this evening's working session. And what's significant is the passion which both the Prime Minister and the Minister of Local Government brings to local government. And it's simply because they believe in local government having come from a background of local government. So I am certain we are going to get the kind of changes that you want to have in local government. At this point in time, I want to recognize Mr. Daphne Badler of the San Fernando Business Association, our presence here this afternoon, and also to mention as I stand out here, the number of young persons that we are seeing in the audience tonight. That must be an extremely good sign for the development of the city of San Fernando and by extension, Trinidad and Tobago.